Kia te iwi, no mai, haru mai, whakatau mai. On behalf of Creative New Zealand, a very warm welcome to you all. Uh, those of you joining in from Aotearoa, I hope you are warm. I know we've had some pretty wild weather uh, these last few days. So let's huddle uh, and open this session with a karakia, a blessing to set the energy for this conversation and connect us all from wherever we're in the world you're tuning in from. Nō reira, me karakia tātou. Tākina te toi nuku, te toi rangi, te toi mataora. Kia wātia, kia māma, kia mārama, tūku. Kia rāna, I'm Catherine George, Senior Advisor at Creative New Zealand, Toi Aotearoa. A quick description of me, I have um, shorter length brown hair, I'm wearing a black polo neck jumper and yellow hee hee shell earrings, and I'm beaming in from Tamaki Makoto, Auckland. Thank you for joining this conversation, which is part of our global wayfinding program. The theme today is into the unknown. Um, and while many of us I know are feeling a little bit apprehensive about what the future may hold, this conversation invites us to open our minds and consider other ways of working or new possibilities for arts practice. Shortly, we'll start with a brief video of our speakers introducing themselves, followed by their live conversation. We'll have 10 minutes at the end for Q&A, so feel free to post your questions via the platform you're watching from. And don't worry if you can't stay for the whole thing. This session will be loaded to our Facebook page and also our YouTube channel afterwards. I'd like to say a very big thank you to our partner Auckland Live for hosting this event and being the conduit for these really important conversations taking place um, over the airwaves. Ngā mihi nui. Right, let's get to the business. It's my pleasure to introduce our two speakers, both fierce advocates for artists and who are going out there exploring new ways of working and just giving things a go. They're not claiming to have all the answers, but they are excited by the potential of the unknown, how we reimagine new ways of working internationally and keeping connections alive. I present to you Chris Nelson and Jessica Balalangi. Hello, my name is Chris Nelson. I'm Artistic Director and CEO of LIFT, the London International Festival of Theatre. Uh, while I'm based in London, I come from an Irish Norwegian and Mennonite settler background. I was born and raised in what's now called Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, which is part of Treaty 6, traditional territories of the Cree, Dene, Nakota, Soto, and Ojibwe people, and homeland of the Métis Nation. Uh, so LIFT is London's International Biennial Festival of Theatre. During the pandemic, uh, we pivoted, well, first we cancelled the festival, and then we pivoted and created a concept touring commissioning project, which is what I'm here to tell you about today. Uh, here we gave 15 artists uh, money and mentorship to work on nine different projects that were about developing international collaborations with little to no travel. So it's really fascinating to see how artists have been moving their practice and how they're taking these sort of steps towards uh, imagining work in different ways. What, it's learn, what we're learning on the same side is like, okay, this is how you might do that project. We're hoping to uh, develop a set of tools or a kind of awareness kit or whatever for presenters and producers. So if this kind of concept touring, these, this modality keeps increasing uh, in the world that presenters and producers are ready to do the extra effort to host the work. And there's a lot of artists who've been working in this way in the last 10, 15 years in contemporary performance, but it feels right to group them under a way, under a kind of um, banner or under a kind of, like to call it a kind of form and, and test what the limits are of that form and learn about the practice that we need to use in order to be able to uh, create that form. So we have to find other ways to bring international artists to our audiences and keep those connections. But I think it's important around the world. And for you as artists in New Zealand, uh, who are, I can only imagine, uh, we're in a, in a rhythm, now to have that stymied uh, can, must feel pretty frustrating to say the least. So perhaps there are some tools or techniques or ways of thinking about your work that the concept touring can kind of bring to open up new ways for you of keeping your connections and also imagining your work uh, traveling um, 
in a non-traditional way or in a, a, a new traditional way. My name is Jessica Palalangi. Um, I am currently living in Tamaki Makaurau in Aotearoa, having most recently returned from London. I've been there for the past 17 years. My ancestral links are to the rock of Polynesia, Nukututaha Niue, and also the wild, wild country that is Alba, otherwise known as Scotland. I'm part of the Inter-Island Collective. So um, Inter-Island Collective was born in the balmy summer of 2018 um, when the UK was celebrating James Cook 250 years since uh, he set sail uh, with myself, Ahila Palaparans, Joe Walsh and Lyle Hakaraya. So we were lucky enough to be selected to have a gallery space in Raven Row, which is in London. We named her Moku, and we also dubbed her our Pacific HQ. And um, we just had this influx of amazing um, practitioners from this side of the world uh, come and visit us. And, you know, we kind of pitch ourselves to be this misfit, queer, Moana collective, um, really just kind of putting the net out there and seeing who we catch. So yeah, a, a lot of what we're doing, I think, is trying to connect with the community beyond London. So, you know, the new iteration of the collective because of where we are now in the world. Um, being part of a Moana collective full of Māori and Pacifica creatives um, has really encouraged and, you know, um, inspired me in and around um, how innovative we are. You know, as people, we constantly um, evolve and change. And I think sometimes um, that's forgotten. You know, a lot of, of how we can be perceived is static and part of a culture from time before. And you know what? There is, um, there is a large, huge number of us who are game changers. And I think that's one of the things that I love about being part of this collective is that it constantly evolves and shapeshifts as it needs to. If you don't get that spiritual top up every time you come home to Aotearoa, you're going to have to try and find new and interesting ways to, you know, um, be that for each other, you know. And so a lot of the work that we're doing, um, we think is regenerative. Whakalofa layatu. Um, my name is Jessica. Um, I have long brown hair that is barely being contained by a purple scrunchie. Um, I'm sitting in front of an amazing um, art wall. I have blue earrings and I have a gold lay on, uh, really thick rimmed spectacles and a navy blue top. Um, before we get this party started, I'd just like to hand over to Chris so he can reintroduce himself, Chris. Thanks, Jessica. Uh, hello, I'm Chris Nelson. I have sandy brown hair, um, a mustache today, a navy blue t-shirt, and I'm sat in front of a gorgeous ficus uh, that's doing really well, and some other plants uh, in front of a bookshelf uh, with the books that have got me through the lockdown and some art and ceramics. Back to you, Jessica. Amazing. Um, well, firstly, Chris, I just wanna say happy birthday to Lyft. So Thank you. 40 years, 40 years of evolving, of adapting, of um, uh, really trying to be pioneering and backing um, lots of different art forms and artists across the world. Um, concept touring is what you mentioned in your preview. Um, do you want to just maybe expand that a little bit and talk about um, where did that come from? You know, sort of what are the influences and in artists or projects that that kind of grew out from? Absolutely. Uh, thank you for the birthday wishes. Um, it's amazing to be with an organization that has this 40 year legacy. I've moved to London three years ago. I've encountered a lot of audience members, a lot of cultural workers, a lot of artists who have had a connection with Lyft, where Lyft has touched them or challenged them or they've made a show for Lyft. Uh, and it's exciting to be taking the, a, a festival with such a legacy to the next steps and stages. Um, the idea of concept touring came, it was one of the things that we did, in, as I said in the video, around in this pivot time, mm -hmm. post-cancellation of the festival, planning a season for this year of 
public artworks and digital projects and a festival for next year. Part of it came out of um, a commissioning project that was what really our canary in the coal mine in a sense for, for the, like, like the UK, if you remember, was lit. You were here still probably. Yeah, I was, so, yeah. Yeah, so we were lit. Remember how that, there was like that one week where United Kingdom thought like the, the pandemic was going to be a couple weeks. Oh, we yeah, totally. Like the rest of Europe was shutting down. The rest of the world was going, no, this is a really big deal. Yeah, so absolutely. In that week, we were meant to be hosting a, a collective from Nairobi called the Nest Collective, incredible filmmakers. Um, and they were filming a series of films uh, profiling Black activists in London working on migration, gender issues, race, uh, uh, health, all, all kinds of things important to them. And then they were going to do another set of films in Cape Town. Sure. And they, they were the first ones to say to us, we're not getting on a plane. Like, yeah. the UK is a basket case and we don't want to bring this virus, whatever it is, back to Kenya. We don't want to risk it. We don't want to get risk it getting yeah. stuck. It's like, we, were, we had been so much in the wind tunnel of getting a program ready and getting the festival ready that we realized, oh, okay, this is for real. And sure yeah. enough, days later, we were canceling the festival. Mm. Anyway, in over the course of the summer, um, with everyone's attention to Black, the Black Lives Matter movement, with yeah. the artists in Kenya being, like, still really feeling that they wanted to make this commission to connect to this kind of experience of Black activism around the world, we devised a way of doing something that we called remote filmmaking. Mm -hmm. So in the autumn, in and amidst several of the tiers of lockdown that we were facing here and they were facing there, yeah. we created this, we partnered with, we engaged a local cinematographer here, mm -hmm. uh, Timmy and John, uh, and John, and Johnny, and um, he became the kind of lens for The Nest, who was based in Nairobi. We yeah. shot in a studio in Peckham. They were in their studio in Nairobi. Uh, they did the interviews with our local activists here, and they did a similar process in Cape Town. And mm -hmm. it became clear that they they could still express themselves, it, their style, the tone of their filmmaking through the collaboration that we engendered with Timmy. Yeah. And we, we found out we were kind of onto something. So mm -hmm. that plus this sort of overall trend um, that I, is that has been true in the performing arts yeah, kind of a way to make the international performing arts touring more local. Like, I'm sure you've seen the shows or been involved in the kinds of projects where it's like, okay, we rock up, but we need you to find us 12 senior citizens to be part of a dance number in the middle of the piece. Or mm -hmm. there's a part of the piece that has a local choir, or um, there are young people involved in the show. There's those kinds of local openings towards locals. Um, there's that kind of trend within the theater. There's uh, this French choreographer called Jerome Bell who said, I'm never getting on a plane or a train again. It's mm -hmm. very easy. He's one of the leading artists in the world and people will pay him lots and lots and lots of money to have someone deliver his work. Yeah. Uh, to a Canadian uh, collective that I've worked with and we've worked with in the past at Lyft called Mammalian Diving Reflex. Mm -hmm. They have a project that I think is epitomizes the idea of concept touring. They mm -hmm. work with a group of eight-year-olds uh, who are from uh, a, a low socioeconomic uh, part of the city, that they're sure. culturally diverse, they don't have access normally to like piano lessons and all the, the normal things of middle class culture uh, consumption or yeah. participation. They teach them how to cut hair. Mm. It's called Haircuts by Children. They take yeah. over a salon and the whole thing is about like, will adults give young people, eight-year-olds, yeah. the aesthetic choice and power over their... Yeah. Oh, yeah. uh, fantastic project and rather than touring it around the world yeah. uh, with young people involved they figured out a way that on the touring rider is find mm. us this group of 25 eight-year-olds mm. we'll, and, and a salon and we'll do the rest so yeah. it's been Pakistan I'm sure it's been to New Zealand it's been to Australia it's been truly all over the world so these kinds of things felt like okay there's something in there mm. to kind of bring things together under a banner or under a new way of thinking, perhaps in investigating it as a new form and call it concept touring. And yeah. at the same time, there's been some other movements around the world that also surged to the forefront. There's a great thing from a theater VD in Switzerland with an artist called Ant Hampton, who's also one of the original makers of this kind of work. Lots of, Ant has made lots of works where you know, two audience members sit in front of, a, sit in front of each other at a cafe, they get mm -hmm. a script, an MP3 player, and they make a plan 
together in front of each other. Yeah. So they're doing a kind of encyclopedia or scoping project called Showing Without Going. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are a few others. So it feels like, I don't know, it feels like we're part of a, a surge or a movement in the same way. Yeah. Uh, this is kind of hokey to say, but like in the same way that there was a race to the vaccine. Yeah. We've, like there's a race now or a, a surge in energy and attention and some really exciting ideas around how to make international theater, yeah. how to make collaborations happen and touring happen uh, that is both pandemic friendly, that can s travel still uh, yep. without, a, without a travel lockdown and yep. also uh, can address uh, the climate crisis. Mm. And so like, um, I guess as well as, you know, what is next for concept touring then? Like, I know that we, uh, you alluded to again, a, a kind of, is it like resources or, you know, the sort of open source knowledge of how other practitioners can um, embrace some of these concepts? Is that kind of the, what's on the horizon or do you just, will it evolve and change as it need to? Like, where do you see it going from here? Well, we did this first round of nine projects and some of them were in really infant stages and yeah. During the course of the mentorship, they got them from an idea stage to whatever the next stage was. Okay. Maybe they're ready for rehearsal. Maybe they're ready to be presented to a, a festival director to say, let's premiere this. Yeah. Or maybe they're ready to go. So we'll, we will hope to produce two or three of the projects next year in the festival mm -hmm. uh, in, our, in June, July. But out of that, and then out of that, in each project, you, you learn all these kinds of things. But mm -hmm. we're really also interested in the kinds of new skills we might need as presenters and producers yep. as a way of saying, okay, how do we work differently? Mm. What other attention do we need to place in order to create these partnerships between artists, audiences, and the festival ourselves? Yeah. So I, and I don't think it's easier necessarily. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm betting we'll say, like someone will say at some point, God, it would be easier to just put them all on a plane, wouldn't it? Yeah. Uh, but if, say, you had a project that we were going to, to, to bring to London, it would be like, yeah. how do I meet mm -hmm. um, your artistic demands, the things that are on the writer, but also how do I find, do I need to find someone in London who has mm -hmm. the same ability as you do to gather people or to, if you're a choreographer, to work, work with movement or, mm -hmm. uh, so it's like, it's a, it's a, there's a sort of casting or different kind of recruitment question as well. I think there's mm -hmm. a bunch, I, there's, I'm imagining all the detail. There's a yeah, whole yeah, sure. details around yeah. skills that we might need to develop differently as presenters and producers. Yeah. And we're, that's the part that we're hoping to do the knowledge sharing that you pointed out. Like we're hoping to um, identify and share and transmit new mm. ways of working uh, because the problems aren't going away. So our yeah. expertise as festival makers uh, have to adapt. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And like, who, I mean, and you already mentioned, um, sorry, was it Theatre VD that was in Switzerland? Yeah. Is there anyone else that you see that's, because obviously, um, I'm kind of always interested in the interconnected, like relationships of who's kind of on this journey with us, do you know what I mean? Because um, you, as, as much as you can be the pioneer, the lone voice and all that kind of stuff, it's really important to, I think, galvanize the community. And so is there anyone else that you feel like on the same journey as, as Lyft or, you know, that um, is encouraging this idea of continuing to make work with, I guess, the precarity of what we're living with globally, you know, so the, the pandemic situation kind of just is fluctuating constantly. So mm -hmm. I feel like this race to a post-COVID life is, you know, I don't think it exists, you know, so, but I'm just wondering how much longer we continue to privilege the in-person events you know like who who else is kind of on this same wave of thinking as yourselves do you think i think there's uh, i think there's a, a, a turn that's happening overall mm -hmm. um one of the mentors that we worked with uh over the course of the concept touring program was ki hong lo mm -hmm. who is the theater director of the west kowloon cultural district yeah in hong kong, hong kong yeah it's a brand new cultural district. They're building all of these incredible venues. Mm -hmm. And it's to be, I mean, it already is incredible. Yeah. But Kiong and, and his team have been working with quite a lot of artists from, uh, from around the world. They've been working with a lot of Australian artists, a lot of Pacifican artists. Mm -hmm. And already pre-pandemic, mm -hmm. they were all becoming the pros of cancellation and transformation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they had 
two or three seasons canceled entirely because of the civil unrest yeah, and the protest happening yeah. in Hong Kong. Add to that the the presence of um, uh, the presence of the pandemic, and they've they've adapted a kind of uh, precarity into their model, sure. an acceptance of precarity into their model, and I think that's also true of. Uh, artists from the global south and presenters from the global who are working with artists from the global south mm -hmm. lift for example we presented an artist uh, faustin linakula from democratic republic of congo in 2018 mm -hmm. and as always uh you know you fight you the artists try and get the visas from the uk home office which is uh proven to be racist against uh, artists from sub-saharan africa and lecturers from yeah. so um in talking with those artists, they were like, well, look, precari like we don't have one of our performers. It's his story. Yeah. <laughs> he, he might not be able to come, but we've embraced a kind of precarity. So we know how to do the work without him, even yeah. though he's the lead. Mm, mm. Now, there's a kind of um, flexibility that I think uh, that is partly about this whole thing around the climate, but is also about different ways of looking at what the what presentation itself could be, you know, I think we tend to think of like present the package, the performance exactly as is mm. Oh God, on a black dance floor instead of a gray dance floor. We can't really do that, you mm. know, and there's, a, or, or this, there's, there's a kind of openness now to precarity and, and um, mm. using it as an element that could propel mm. you forward rather than hinder you. Yeah. I think it presents a really interesting conundrum around, um, around that idea of presentation, right? Because I think those are, uh, for some artists and practitioners, those details are essential into the present presentation of the work. But I guess it's also um, being able to communicate to artists, you know, not what is the contingency, but you know, this idea of how can it how can it move and evolve. Um, and be less rigid or or um, static, you know, which I think is really important anyway, right? To to understand um, how it can be, how it can resonate and be relevant to to the audience. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I hope that's an exciting. I I, I think for all artists who've been working through this period of time and imagining, okay, I can't, might not be able to do my show live. So does that mean I'm canceling it? Does that mean I'm doing it in the back of a Lori in the mm. park audience mm -hmm. instead of a black box theater yeah. or am i doing online i think art i know i heard i like i heard and saw artists on social media at the beginning go mm. please a minute we don't want to rethink everything mm. but a year later, or a year and a half later i think i've been so imp like inspired every day by how um new flu the new fluidity that people are finding yeah and I, and i i hope that there's something in that uh, like the quest for the essence mm. and and mm. a kind of dismantling of perfection might have might change our relationship to what we're presenting and how we're presenting yeah. it and what yeah, we're making yeah yeah absolutely um and I think you know just thinking about some of the projects that that you were doing I guess throughout the the ebb and flow of the pandemic um you know the artists the sort of live instagrams was that something that you had done before or was that kind of just like us all, we just kind of grabbed onto any piece of tech and we were like, let's give it a whirl. Was that kind of what it was like? Yeah. Yeah. It was exactly what it was like. I, I didn't, I hadn't done it. We thought about like, okay, what are some ways we could talk, connect with our friends around the world more yeah. when we're not doing a festival. And uh, I guess my journey at Lyft has really been like, okay, get that 2020 festival going. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, and then it's like, okay, you can't. So yeah, yeah. It, like, do so, like, how else can we, um share interesting ideas and 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 spotlight interesting people and engage in, in different things so yeah we created a podcast series it's been really yeah. fun yeah yeah uh, and you you too you must have i mean i'm I'm very curious jessica about how you've taken inter islanders which started as a, a group of pacifican artists in yeah. london gathering yeah. together and going we're making space for yeah. all the home that we love and yeah. really turning uh, like and I've been, I went to some of your events and they were fantastic and like, yeah. like really keying in the Londoners to yeah. what's happening on the other side of the world. What's yeah. it, where are you guys at now that you're, yeah. 
your home. <laughs> where are all you? Are? Where yeah, are you? Yeah, I mean, we're we we are scattered across more islands. I think is probably the 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 quick answer in terms of. Yeah, I mean, look, I think when we first started, um, space was really important for us. I think we really felt like we needed to carve a space out to then kind of understand how to bring the community together, you know, this idea of galvanizing. And so um, Moku became this space, like a hub, where we could kind of bring everyone in that was already within the community, but then also be able to um, manaki and look after artists that were coming through. Um, because at that point, you know, everybody was kind of over here. We had Oceania, we had um, Venice Biennale, you know, so there was a whole contingent of Māori and Pacific artists that we were just like, you know, really wanting to hang out with more than anything, you know, kind of just um, just, just converse and just like, you know, share food and talk about their art practice. And, you know, I think it was really important for us to have a connection to home, you know, um, because at that time we were not intentional about social media. Like if anything, it was just a bit of a pain in the ass that we didn't really have time to deal with, you know? Um, and it was, yeah, it wasn't something that we were intentional about in terms of who we were, um, apart from, you know, the odd events and things like that. But I think it was really important for us at that time to bring everyone together. And then, yeah, of course the pandemic happened, our space um, was closed. And has reopened now, but it's been, you know, up and down like it has with everything. So all of a sudden we couldn't come together. Um, and it was a real struggle. Um, definitely, you know, so let's think about like from March to the summer in July, that period was really hard for us trying to understand what to do now. And some of us weren't really that digital and didn't really want to be and you know we're kind of a bit averse to it um and then we kind of had a real turning point at, at Masariki um last year where we were like look what does it mean now to connect you know and so we ended up doing this little mini project to each other where we sent each other these kind of what little mini whatsapp videos and they became these kind of um intentional kind of you know um in a way manifesting I think trying to like really understand and what, what would get us going again creatively um I think spiritually emotionally you know everybody was feeling very you know we didn't really know what was happening and I think I think here we don't have a sense of how um uh, the environment was because you know the government doesn't really tell you much in the UK about how things are going so it was really quite hard to articulate that um, but when you were in it you understood that it was just very strange um, to, to sort of know how to behave and things like that um, and so we started really thinking about how to how to do digital stuff you know I think there was this expectation that artists would like you know, the word of 2020 pivot and like understand, oh, take your old artist to practice online now, you know, and we didn't really know how to do that. And so it was a lot of testing and kind of figuring out and like, like yourselves, we'd never done lives before. We'd never really engaged with Instagram to the degree that we do now. Um, but I just feel like there's a lot more receptiveness to mm -hmm. doing a lot more digital stuff. Um, was having a talk to Mamoy, who's in the collective this morning, and we were talking about how our perception of how to connect over digital means, or maybe social media is a, a different example, but we kind of are just like a bit more bold and we're just kind yeah. of like, we're just going to go for it, you know? And, um, but even, you know, Instagram has become this kind of like necessary evil in my life, but it is like the auntie, the, the kind of, you know, the dictionary, the the teacher and all these kind of, that plays all these different roles. And I think for us, that's been a really key way for us to connect to artists back here. Um, I think, yeah, we've tried a bit harder to kind of unveil who we are as the collective. I think we all kind of use it as a nice kind of barrier sometimes. So yeah, um, I think for us, it was about how do we connect again and how do we what does that look like, you know, and how do we adapt some of those practices that we would normally um, undertake in a setting together? Um, you know, when we put an online show on, we wanted to have the presence of like opening the space with a, a karakia, 
And so we, we put that into our website, you know, but tried to make it sort of emulate what it would be like if you were going into a space, you know. We also closed the website and got rid of it, you know, when it was done, because we were kind of like, we didn't want it to exist forever, you know. We were just trying to really, I guess, take some of these practices that were really important to us around opening and closing space and existing in space and, you know, mimicking it online, you know, um, yeah. And has it, um, do you think there, like the, that mimicking that you're doing online, uh, have there been, has it opened up new avenues? Do you feel different making together or different doing together? Yeah. Um, a fire burning that was there before? I think a bit of both. Like, mm. you know, I feel like um, there's definitely loss in the distance and in the, the boxes mm. on the screen, you know. Yeah. Um, I think there are definitely practices that we wouldn't do online because they don't have the same resonance in terms of um, the making together, that making process is really important. Um, just as important as the kind of like the product or what you you make the yeah. output um yeah so I think it's been again it's been this push pull you know this tension of kind of like do we think we could do that that doesn't feel right okay let's not do it that way you know um but I do feel like we're becoming accustomed to kind of being this um you know we've talked about being in the diaspora from the UK but I now feel like I'm in a different diaspora <laughs> you know so I've like come back to Aotearoa and I'm part of this different community that's again trying like reintegrating but also has a, a real view of um the expansiveness of what what's possible out there you know um and I I was you know I do kind of think about some of the ways that we might be self-isolating here I mean, for lack of a better term, <laughs> in Aotearoa because of our location, you know, and because the borders are closed and all these types of things. So, yeah, I'm still, I'm really keen for us to maintain these relationships and to just keep working on them. And I think it is about being really intentional about that, you know, and being, um, you know, uh, prioritizing that, that relational connection between not only us as a collective, but the communities that are abroad as well, yeah. I think that's true. I think, um, and the, the flow of the world mm. is going in the other direction. Like mm. I, I feel it often, uh, and it's something we talk about uh, at Lyft too, or, but, but it's like, you know, for, and if for an international festival to exist in London now, uh, post Brexit and out of the pandemic and at a time when um, Londoners are really focused on the local and everywhere and around the world has been really focused on the local. So to say, well, yeah, that's, I mean, we're, and we will do lots of things to celebrate the city and our festivals. Yeah. At the same time, we really want to be like, not forget what, mm. what's in DNA and what we're made for. Yeah. Uh, which is about bringing amazing international artists uh, to the city and to, to Londoners. Yeah. So I imagine it feels the same way for you. You've come home, you've been away. Yeah. yeah. Um, and just knowing that there's so much of a rich community over there, do you know, I feel like, um, yeah, the, this, the, I'm, I love it now. I feel like we are, um, you know, the community here and the artists that are based here are really interested in what's happening over there because I think we've tried to be open about it and we've tried to be really inclusive of, you know, opportunities that we have and opportunities that we want to create for artists. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I hope we continue to have that relationship where we are, like you said. I don't want to continue. It's not about prioritizing one or the other, but I think it's about how do they harmoniously, like, support each other. You know, this idea of local, regional, national, international. Yeah. You see the collective having a, um, a role at home where you're, you're, you're bridging the, the, in, the flip, in the other way? Yeah, 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 I think so. Yeah, I mean, um, I've loved being at home and meeting artists. I mean, you know, you have these weird interactions where you've, you've kind of followed people online and then you meet them in real life and you have this weird kind of moment of like, 
do I say hi or do I say I follow you? Like it feels very that's, <laughs> that's you, you know? like a bit star star star. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, I guess, I guess star yeah. Star. <laughs> um, but I have really loved being at home and actually having um some of these in real life face-to-face -face conversations and yeah. sharing space. Um, and also being afforded the opportunities like these to talk about how the collective works and um, yeah, just to kind of grow that community here. Um, mm -hmm. I think we'll always, um, there is always a, 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 I think a need to, to think about artists living in the diaspora. So um, our main kind of connection between us, even though we are diverse is that Aotearoa is a version of home, you know, so we kind of have that um, that we always um, speak back to. But I'm really keen to just get these conversations happening between artists, you know, um, getting um, artists to present work in London, which we've got coming up, similar to some of your public artworks, you know, we've, we've got a Bill Woodwork coming up, which is I'm really excited about. Um, and then also getting some of um, our artists in the collective, like seeing their works here, which is um, something that I'm curating um, shortly, where one of our artists is like doing a work and shipping the whole thing over. And and I guess I, I get to then play with it and make this, you know, fill a, a gallery window, which I'm really looking forward to. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that uh, with the work that you're doing as a collective and the, the work that you're seeing and, and facilitating with other artists uh, are you seeing are you noticing different practices or different things that you're doing as a presenter um or are you looking for different things from people who might present your work than you might have been pre-pandemic yeah i think um i think i really resonated what you were saying around you know um how how can how much can it move before you don't lose the essence of what you were trying to articulate, you know, like the concept, the the ideology or, or whatever. So I think that I'm really interested in how that can be retranslated, you know. So this idea of this um, work that I'm doing that's coming up is, you know, so this all this hours and all this making that's happening in London, like how do I then take that back and mm -hmm. reflect both um, kind of scenarios and parts of this artist's life, you know, um, that in London, but then also their kind of tether to here. So, yeah, I think there feels like there's a, an openness maybe to explore how things could exist. Um, I think, yeah, one of the things that I'm, you know, constantly trying to think about is how, how do we create different access points into works, you know, so um, whether that be through, you know, sort of letting it exist in a different form or asking an artist to respond to it, you know, um, that was something that we did recently with the Telenor series, which I, is similar to your Instagram lives, but you know, we then had a poet respond to a, a pre-recorded kind of curated episode, um, which was a really wonderful experience in terms of them being based in Australia and I was in between here in the UK and then we specifically focused on artists who were based away from Aotearoa. Um, just to kind of have these satellites, you know, and, and understand what other communities and artists are doing, you know, similar to what, what you were doing. It was kind of like, how do we reconnect again? How do we know what people are up to, you know? Yeah, you that's know? what it was. I mean, exactly that, because everyone has been so focused on, certainly for a lot of it, like, what are the rules? You know, you get on a call and someone says, what are the rules where you are? What, what are you like? <laughs> <laughs> what are you not allowed to do yeah. how bad is it like there's that's yeah. been kind of a concern so we did this uh, podcast series called plans for the future where we talked to five yeah. different artists and presenters um i was curious about the what what's happening where you are and then like how are you planning mm, like how yeah, are you totally. imagining okay. this is like like are um, you planning yeah 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 are you done in six months or are we like or is this like this forever and it, mm. i mean it's always the place where people are no one wants to really hedge their bet and say, I think it's going to be like this. Like, Oh, no, absolutely not. I don't think we're, yeah, like I think that those times are well and truly over in terms of being able to predict, um, yeah, or even, yeah, even wanting to put it out there, I think, you know, I just think, yeah, we've, we've learned over the last, you know, 18 months that that's not something that we can do. I'm interested in terms of like, how far um you know so we're already kind of in this hyper connected world like mm. how far do you think the tech can go so or, or can it like how can it 
how can we push it? I think because I'm like thinking about AR and I'm thinking about, mm. you know, haptic floors and all these kind of like really cool things that are doing um, amazing stuff. But how far can it really go? Uh, you know, do you see anything on the horizon that you're excited about or are we kind of reaching that saturation point? Like, what do you, what do you think? I, I get excited by the things that enable a kind of weird return to um, like the real uh, 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 elemental things about the theater. Mm -hmm. um, and I get, I get kind of less excited about the, the the bells and whistles of the whole technical thing. I think it's yeah. maybe why we didn't run, like when we canceled, we didn't go, okay, we're doing a digital festival. We went, okay, sure. let's stop with this work. Yeah. See where, where it will evolve differently. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like there's conversations again in the, in the world about like, what do you do about a Whitney Houston hologram yeah. or a Tupac uh, hologram? Can you put them on at a concert? Is it ethical? Yeah. Um, one of the projects in concept touring is by uh, is an art, is a is a project that involves storytelling traditions from the southwest uh, asia and north african uh, storytelling tradition it involves a film uh it involves um without giving i i should i'll credit the artist it's rather than not trying not to give something away it's, yeah. uh, the artist is george ohanisi and nardine uh they are an armenian artist based in milan mm -hmm. the, the piece is a, a piece called gisher which is a a film essentially mm -hmm. about the Armenian Azerbaijani conflict. Yeah. The audience watches and then they come out and there's a bonfire. Oh, and we wow. hear voices and these storytelling, the story, this these stories told. Mm -hmm. And one of the things about the work is uh one of the things that Georgia was working on over the course of concept touring was how do we involve different storytellers from different places mm -hmm. as the work travels. Um mm -hmm. so that has a kind of you know imagining doing it here georgia might meet people over zoom and and coach them in the storytelling tradition or mm -hmm. things or say respond to the film in this way here's the invitation to you mm -hmm. but then and then we record them and then we broadcast them and the audience is around the fire and we hear them in these mm -hmm. speakers so there's something tech this te te technological that's helped us all we've all had yeah. an experience of hearing a story around the fire mm -hmm. yeah of course yeah 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 Really, what I think of is like uh, ele elemental in a sense, um, but there's lots of technology technology that's helped us get there. Mm, yes. uh, I think I think what the theater has learned overall in this past year is like we've all raced to be broadcasters and we've raced to become more interactive. Is like mm -hmm. there's a lot of other fields that we could learn from better, like mm -hmm. gaming mm -hmm. or uh, film and television or mm -hmm. digital digital media that perhaps the theater has been kind of going, going like, oh, there are interesting cousins, but we're not, we don't, we don't have <laughs> fun with them. And now yeah. we really needed to pay attention a bit more. Yeah. Um, I'm, and I, I've loved it. I've loved the moments when I've seen those fields connect with uh, the visual art or the theater sector, uh, because then it's where it's been more about concept or, mm. or, or the content of the work as opposed to perhaps its commerciality or marketability mm. um, but those tensions those tensions i think are still playing out in terms yeah. of what about you are you is, is there something that you're going oh that's the thing about uh, right in the next five years not not really not really like i i feel like i'm at this i don't know um you know how i i, I think we talked before about how time feels really strange at the moment like it's kind of either going really fast or really slow and then I think our then our kind of relationship with it is also kind of doing the same thing you know and so when I think about tech and I think people are you know initially we always kind of look to it to be this thing that makes everything faster and more efficient and you know kind of um is this great problem solver but I'm also kind of really interested in this return to or, or this idea of moving a bit slower or you know um not having to be um you know i guess in some ways you know similar to what you're saying about returning to the elemental like what does what does that look like what does that mean um i'm i'm interested in that um i feel like i don't want to i'm i'm interested in tech but i think i don't want to lose anything i i feel like i don't want to have to minimize or um 
you know, downsize the experience um, because of what I what might seem really, um, I don't know, advanced or exciting or something like that. Yeah. Um, and I, I worry about us becoming tired because we're so interconnected, right? Like in terms of like the, the digital distractions that we have constantly and, you know, um, the tech that keeps us on all the time, you know, I, I wonder how that will impact us as we, as we keep going, you know? Um, yeah. But yeah, I think it's, I, I mean, it's still fascinating. I think, you know, um, even the way in which some of our collective members have really embraced tech has really been surprising for me. Like I really loved watching this um, evolving um, style that, you know, um, Mamoy, one of our collective members has in terms of using video to kind of um, document her work and really, um, you know, as a multidisciplinary artist, kind of like integrating like video and, you know, music and all of these types of things has been really fascinating to watch. Um, because initially I knew her as a block printer. So, you know, you've kind of like really gone on this yep. kind of journey. And yeah, and I, th I think I like the way that we've tried to use as much different um, con connective tech, you know, so like, kind of how can we reach out to each other but um yeah at the same time we kind of like we're going back and forth you know there's this, this kind of like oscillation between mm. fast slow um you know kind of old new whatever that means yeah um but yeah I think it's 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 really interesting I, I'm you know when Catherine was talking about we're excited about the unknown I mean I don't know if you are I I see it as a potency piece mm -hmm. You know, like what is what else is possible now? It feels like um, there just seems to be room for more. I, I don't know. I don't know. Do you do you feel the same way or? I feel like we are in the unknown for sure yeah. right now. Absolutely. Um, and at the beginning of that. Yeah. I like there is the paradigm shift is happening now. It's not, and I might have imagined it as like, oh well, it's like it takes a couple of months, mm. and then the world changes, or it takes a week. Yeah, and perhaps it does. I mean, we all had this. We've the world has had a collective experience of lockdown. Yeah. So that thing, that instant happened, but the the curve out of it, or the like, the transformational period that happens after this. Yeah. Is now, mm -hmm. and it's long term. I yeah. Think. And so, I. I know, like, it's sort of like, oh, I'll know it when I see it, uh, yeah. but I know that I, I have encountered it among art, like among what artists are making or what they're thinking yeah. about, um, that feels like, oh, this is in the unknown, mm. not from the future. This is like where we're, this is, but this is in the unknown and they're, they're uh, or it's of this time. Yeah. And it's towards this other time. I, like, I think about, I, cause I keep thinking about it in terms of like, what will it look, what will this time how will historians talk about this time? Mm, yeah. How would it look like in a film? Mm. You know, if you saw different people wearing different things, would you know yeah. how embracing of the unknown or embracing of the future are they, or are they stuck in the past? Absolutely, um, yeah. Like yeah. Such a, there's so much transition, transformation, resetting that we're all managing. Yeah, absolutely. Managing and enacting. Yeah um that we're like definitely right in the unknown and i yeah. think we're going to be there for a while i agree I yeah. we're all going to have a kind of long covid mm. um which has some which benefits is, yeah some and sense. i don't think that that's something that we have even know about here in aotearoa you know this idea of long covid i was talking to someone the other day who only ever heard about it when they were talking to someone else overseas Right. You know, I think that the that perception of COVID and long COVID is is very different here. Um, uh, I guess by the time the, um, there's the medical long COVID where you get sick and then you still don't have smell for two years, or yeah. you have crippling migraines or debilitating migraines for two years, uh, or um, all kinds of things happen mm -hmm. happen to people that are long term. But yeah. the societal long COVID, I mean, is we've all sort of had COVID or we're having COVID yeah. right now. Even you in in New Zealand, where your people are moving around freely, but only on the only on those islands. Yeah. Um, 
like the after effects of the trans societal transformation, the changes to our families, the mm -hmm. people who've lost work, the people who've migrated home or who haven't migrated home or mm -hmm. uh, all of those things, the, the after effects uh, yeah. could be quite long. Absolutely. And at the same time, we've got, we've got this vaccine and <laughs> yeah. everyone's having hot girl summer or whatever. Yeah. And it's like this yeah. is like the roaring 2020s are also happening yeah. uh, in some places here, like over here, you know, they declared Freedom Day, the day that we lost all the restrictions, but yeah. you know the Delta yeah. variant come through the vaccines, as I yeah. know myself. So um, we are getting a, a signal anyway, a little yeah. alarm clock from our organizers that it might be time for questions. Yes, um, yeah, absolutely. So do you, I don't have any in front of me? Do you have any? I don't. I don't have any. But when they do come through, oh, okay, yeah, I've got one. Um, so what's what's our sense of the non Aotearoa appetite for digital art? Are people burnt out? And what, in your opinion, has been successful in this space? Um, well, TikTok has been really successful and all the makers on tick of TikTok have been ultra yeah. successful. Yeah. Uh, so the what's in what's in people's hands and what people are making has been super successful. Mm -hmm. uh, and in terms of maybe what I would call formal making, meaning someone funded it or yeah. um, without a, like, yeah, but the, the formal kind of making maybe hasn't been as successful. I don't, mm -hmm. I think people are burnt out, but I think those, like when you said, Jessica, all the things that are kind of coming at us digitally, I think we're burnt out, but we're still gonna consume. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I think maybe looking to different forms, right? Like, like you were saying, I mean, TikTok is a vibe, you know, and it works. And we're definitely not burnt out from stuff like that. But yeah. I don't know if it's because of the, of its ability to be short and funny and irreverent and, you know, yeah, made by someone at home. Like it's it's almost that kind of, um, that look in. Like we're we're already doing it now. Like that line of personal and, you know, public and private has already come down. And I feel like we're just kind of, it's getting that momentum as well. You know, things like TikTok and and yeah uh, this is a question for you jess jess you spoke about taking down the website as it ended but yeah. how do you feel about that magic of sharing space the vawa of performances that are perhaps one time temporary and how we save share keep these sort of chats and performances i guess the question is around the balance between the permanence and recognizing the power of art theater in the shared va that's a very long question, but <laughs> I think for, yeah, it's a, it is a balance of understanding from a collective point of view. So, you know, we, it wasn't a decision that we made um, in isolation. It was just kind of like, this feels like the right thing to do. Um, we spoke with the artists about it. We offered to remove their um, works and put them on our, you know, our other website to sort of, if they did want it to, kind of live forever somewhere else. So I think it was about providing options and having that kind of open dialogue of, you know, this is what we want to do. This feels right for us as a collective. We feel as though um, because of the nature of this exhibition, it had a, it had a life and now that's come to an end. Um, but we talked about almost like putting it to sleep, you know, so now it, it kind of doesn't exist in this realm anymore. Um, but, you know, it has a possibility to live elsewhere if that's what the artist wanted. Um, with all of the original intentions and the context to contextual framing around why it was made in the first place. So I think it's just something that we approach as we go, you know. Um, I think with that specific exhibition, it was clear from the start that we wanted it to have a very definitive open and a very definitive close. Um, and yeah, and I guess um, again, approaching the documentation and, and what we hold on to, again, it's just a, I feel like it's a decision that we make collectively amongst the community, you know, sort of like, what do we want to document? How do we want to do that? Um, who wants to be involved? How do they want to be framed? You know, very much um, from a shared curation point of view. Does that make sense? Great. Um, so question to you, Chris. During the concept touring residency, how did you get artists to think outside of the live performance mentality to consider touring without physically being there? 
That is a great question. Uh, they involved, so they were working with their mentors. Yeah. Um, we were kind of, I mean, we were gearing up for, the projects are geared so that they are live, most mm -hmm. of them. Yeah. They are mostly geared to be live. The thing, the, the catch is um, the artist doesn't travel. So yesterday, for example, Maiko Yamamoto, who's an uh, artist, we're working with one of the artists who's based in Vancouver, in mm -hmm. Canada, uh, her project is imagines it's called Best Life, and it imagines a giant room full of suburban appliances, machines, and objects, which mm -hmm. to her are uh, important socioculturally, but also personally. Sure. And in, in the project, um, imagine that you entered a space with all of these appliances and as audiences, you would kind of speak for them and speak with them and interact with this yeah. sort of giant museum. Now in Maiko, the challenge for Maiko to imagine it as a concept touring piece is that there's not a big shipping container full of all these appliances coming from Vancouver to go to Auckland for, uh, to perform at the Auckland Festival. Mm -hmm. Or, um, nor perhaps is she even traveling. Mm -hmm. So if it was going to the Wellington Festival or it was coming to New Zealand, would they have to find a Maiko who would be the sort of MC of this mm -hmm. moment? Yeah. Would they have to find a designer to work with her and a mm -hmm. props designer to gather all the set pieces? Mm -hmm. um, how would we make sure that the audience had a, a similar invitation to interact in their way as they might in Vancouver? So yeah. those are the kind of questions that are in her on her horizon in terms of mm -hmm. things she might answer. Mm -hmm. um, but we were also thinking about, so in a, in a, so that those are the kinds of challenges to the artist, which was as, as much like, okay, who might you need on the other side of the, the like soup can with the court? Like yeah. who do you need on the other side of things yeah, to make exactly. sure you can look yeah. at this? Uh, what, do, what do you need from the presenter, but also what do you need, what other artists might you need on the other end of mm. on the other um, And we're finding that out. Like that's yeah. the stuff that we're finding out uh here's one for both of us jess is this an opportunity for us to rethink what success looks like for individual artists in terms of their own practice as well as a broader artistic community should we take this moment to reflect on what we truly value i mean i think the short answer is yes absolutely i think um i'm all of i'm really really supportive of this idea that um what I what I think is successful also has agency, rather mm -hmm. than what um, collectively an, another institution organization might you know label as success. Um, I don't think that we have these dialogues at all, really. You know, uh, we might have them on a peer to peer basis, maybe, maybe not, depending on the the, the kind of the level of trust and openness that that exists. But I don't see those conversations permeating perhaps some of the places they should, um, you know, in terms of, um, I guess, those who are funders or those who decide, you know, I have those kind of um, big levers to pull. Yeah, I don't know. What do you think? I think absolutely it's a time to reflect. Mm -hmm. I think and I see and have experienced uh, that artists and institutions alike uh, have been racing to restart, go again, get it, get live again, or get digital, mm -hmm. yeah. pivot, move, yeah. transform, go, go, uh, go, 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 go. And mm -hmm. yes, we absolutely need to, like the sector, so there's been that push. And at the same time, freelancers and institutions and everyone has been saying, we need to do this differently mm -hmm. and we're calling for change. Yeah. The thing that we're not doing yet as a sector, I think both as artists and as institutions, is is finding ways to work on what we value, mm. to like really assess, to do that thing of like looking at what we value mm. in a way that acknowledges the pressures of moving quickly now. So you moving so like the existential crisis of like mm. if you're not going, are you alive? Yeah, and also that deals with the trauma of what we've lost. Mm, yeah and where does the triumvirate of the audience come in do you think because like you I know, know. So, I mean I think a lot of that you know yeah. the idea of success is balanced on you know reception audience perception reaction you know so yeah I think the other kind of 
it, the refraction is kind of like, and where does the audience sit within this too? Yes, exactly. And like what, you know, as we're doing that reassessment, the audience is going, like they just want to, they, I, my experience of audiences at this moment and people yeah. that I meet when I say I work in the theater and they go, oh God, what's the <laughs> yeah. are you okay? Say, yeah. Um, are you okay? And then they're like, what's yeah. on? We really want to see like, yeah. So yeah. they want, uh, they still want to be a part of it. Mm. That hasn't changed. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, some other questions that are coming up and I am aware we're coming to time. So maybe we want to answer one of these final ones. What do you think? Yeah. Uh, maybe oh, the, maybe the one around long COVID through isolation. Yeah. How do we change ways of seeing and doing in Aotearoa? Um, yeah, I mean, I think we are we are almost in a really big bubble here. You know, um, you know, yes, we can move around freely, but we can't actually leave. Um, you know, which I think is. Um, does does make it a challenge in, in terms of understanding what what is out there. But I think for me, it, it's about leaning into networks and being bold in that way um, and continuously seeking connection strategically, um, you know, through your sort of however that might manifest, but it's kind of like we have to keep this interconnectedness going um, is kind of my very short answer because I see Catherine looking at me. Yeah, I think uh, I think that's. I mean, from the outside, yeah. and as someone who's not been there, um, but has met a lot of artists and, and cultural workers from there, mm. uh, and that, and where there's a similar sense of we're out. Does anybody know we're here? Mm. Uh, that, that I feel sometimes as a Canadian, um, a similar sense of like there's a very robust local scene, and is there? You know, where are the connections out? Uh, is maintaining like stoking that curiosity. Mm. And now it's a great time to, yeah. to um, do the thing that you never thought you'd do, like, or write the email you never thought you'd write or yep. try and connect and reach someone who you might've thought was uh, unreachable or impossible yep. to reach before. Yeah. Um, now is a great time to take the risk, I think. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, well, because there is so much change happening, right? Because you've got this kind of, you know, like we were saying, it, it is a catalyst and a race to go through, but also, you know, um, there is this, I, I do feel as though we are, you know, there are places in which gaps are being made, you know, and we can, you know, understand what we can do to to kind of, you know, get in there and 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 cut through and intersect where we where we need to. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. I think that's a brilliant piece of advice. <laughs> it's so great to talk to you again. Yeah, um, thank you. I was watching, we got Jessica and I got the, had the luxury of also getting to, to chat before. And it's just, it's always so wonderful to talk to you. Yeah. Uh, no, I wish you all the best over there. Yeah. And you, and um, I hope that we can connect in concept or in real life at some point in real, real life. Yeah. Um, and yeah. And, and thank you to the um, international team at Creative New Zealand for, for setting this conversation up. Yeah. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Creative NZ. I think, Catherine, you're going to come back and say a few words. Amazing. Yeah. Cool. Oh, yeah. Um, thank you so much, Kristen and Jessica, for such a rich exchange, um, sharing your experiences, those of the artists that you work with. Um, I think we all know how much of a difference it makes when artists have a safe space or a platform to experiment and to take those risks. So um, I thank you for being that conduit for them. Um, it's been such a challenging 18 months for everyone. So on behalf of Creative New Zealand, thank you for giving us um, just this moment to lift our heads and be optimistic about the future um, and its many possibilities. So ngā mihi nui kia kurua. Um, and so just to round off this conversation, um, let's close the loop the way that we started with a karakia. Mia noi tātou, tākina te toinuku, te toirangi, te toimataora, kia wātea, kia mama, kia marama, tuku. Happy 40th birthday, Lift. Thank you so much. <laughs>